glad to be here. And it must be a little bit slower than I get that. Um, so my, my presentation today uh, will have uh, three main parts uh, besides uh, the conclusions. Um, I, I will start by analyzing uh, the nature of a debt crisis, why debt crisis occurred, what they mean for the people of the country, what they mean for the function of a society, uh, and uh, how to address uh, that crisis, why it's important to uh, design and implement policies to address the problems that arise in situations of that crisis. The second part will focus on a key tenet for the resolution of the debt crisis, which is the process of sovereign debt restructuring which is essentially about rewriting debt contracts, redefining debt commitments. And I'll describe how this process is work, not just at a technical level, but also at a power level. Power is key to understand uh, the resolution of sovereign debt crisis. The third part will refer to a key actor of the international financial system, that plays a critical role in the resolution of sovereign debt crisis. We say not for bad and for good, but it does play a role, which is the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Um, and we will discuss the work, how the institution works, what the institution represents, and how the negotiation with the IMF actually works. Uh, and then we will conclude with uh, the, the political me the message of the political nature of this process of sovereign debt crisis resolution. So let me begin with the phenomenon of a sovereign debt crisis. Why crisis happen? Well, there may be different reasons why a crisis happen. One possibility may be just bad luck. There are countries that suffer natural disasters uh, there was a probability that a natural disaster uh, could occur and it, once it hits the economy, the economy doesn't have the resources to meet its debt commitments. That's like the easiest or most simple way uh, or most simple phenomenon of sovereign debt crisis. But most crises are of a different nature. They reveal a failure of the economic system of the productive system for the development, to the deliver development for the nation. So the commitments that are made at some point based on an expectation of two sides, the debtor and the creditor, that with certain probability they will be met, cannot be met when we see that the economic system fails. Debt crisis can mark the lives of an entire generation. Generally, they are associated with unemployment, increases in poverty, increases in inequality, social distress, a sense of lack, lack of hope, lack of opportunities, and of course, uh, political instability as well. The workings of the debt crisis is as follows. Typically what happens, as Charles explained, is that on the one hand, when a government has too much debt in foreign currency, given the incomes that it creates in foreign currency and continues servicing that debt, it basically runs out of foreign exchange. When a country runs out of foreign exchange, it has problems for importing, for the imports, and imports are a key input for the production of the economy, so production tends to contract. At the same time, when there is a scarcity of foreign exchange, the value of the exchange rate depreciates. The currency becomes weaker. When the currency becomes weaker, there is inflation. So sovereign debt prices are maybe associated to these two extremes of uh, macroeconomic phenomena, sometimes more to one than to the other, which are unemployment, on the one hand, and inflation. Countries that have fixed exchange regimes, like for instance Greece, when it had its crisis that was part of the Eurozone, 
suffer unemployment rather than inflation. Countries that have floating exchange receipts tend to suffer more inflation than unemployment. But inflation also means fall in the real value of the incomes, of the wages. So one way or the other, the people suffer. And if this phenomenon is not addressed, what happens is that the government, every uh, when, when time passes, has a larger and larger burden of their payments. And in order to meet their payments, what does the government do? It cuts other expenses. Typically, those are easier to cut. What's the easiest, uh, typically, around the world? Public infrastructure, which is reduce investments in public infrastructure. Or uh, certain expenses are critical for the development in the middle term of the nation, like education, health, even pensioners suffer the consequences of that crisis. So there are then effects both in the short term and in the middle term. In the short term, the economy contracts or has more inflation, but in the middle term, we damage productivity. So countries lag behind if they don't address this crisis. Basically, an entire generation can suffer the consequences in the way of uh, an underdevelopment drop. So that's why it's so important to address over the prices. Uh, we have a saying that says, the debt don't pay the debts. So a country that doesn't restore the sustainability of the debt and creates enough space for economic recovery in the short term and in the middle term, eventually is unable to pay the debts anyway. So res restoring the capacity to repay debts is important not just for the debtor, also for the creditors as a whole. So when this happens, there has to be a restructuring of the debts. There's one important aspect, aspect of sovereign debt that we need to take into account. So there are different forms of debt. A country can have debt with the IMF, debt with China, debt with the Paris Club, debt with other multilateral development banks, or debt with the private sector. And that debt can be denominated in the domestic currency, so it could be in uh, Sri Lankan rupees, or in foreign currency, like for instance, US dollars. Mm -hmm. Every debt, sovereign debt contract with private creditors in foreign currency includes a compensation for risk in developing economies. Everyone understands that there is a risk that the country won't have the capacity to repay. So when the country pays, pays more, much more than what advanced economies pay on its debt contracts. You, Sri Lankan taxpayers, pay much more to your creditors when you pay than what American taxpayers pay. Which is recognizing that there will be circumstances in which there will be a restructuring. Otherwise, there will be a transfer of a rent from the Sri Lankan taxpayers to the American financial system or the European financial system if you never restructure your debts, despite the fact that there is a risk premium included in the debt contracts. Risk premium means an extra compensation just in case the country can't pay. So the existence of that extra interest is what justifies the debt restructuring when they need to be done. Well, now you are in that circumstance. Many different, you're, and you're not alone. As Charles was explaining, there are many countries that are going through that situation. We had a meeting at the Vatican with Pope Francis last Wednesday. I was called addressing the debt crisis in the global south. And the concern is that we have every month a new country falling into a situation of debt distress. It's a global phenomenon. After 15 years, in which at the beginning, after the US financial crisis in 2008, we had an increase in global liquidity, and the American hedge funds and investment funds were searching for opportunities to invest the money that would produce higher returns, but that also means higher risk. If you have higher returns and no higher risk, that tell me the recipe. That doesn't really exist, so everyone knew that they were taking higher risks. And then we had the pandemic. And then we had the war in Ukraine. And the Federal Reserve of the United States started to, to contract 
the amount of money in the global economy. There is, there is a lower amount of US dollars now in the global economy. So it's more difficult for countries to find financing. So they cannot refinance the debts. What Sri Lanka is going through is the same that many other countries are going through. And that's why we are seeing debt restructurings, so many right now. We have had a phenomenon with certain similarities in the decade of the 1980s. After the crisis of the OPEC, the countries that export oil that colluded and the prices went up and then again the Federal Reserve of the US increases the, increase the interest rates and many countries suffer the consequences. And those who didn't address their prices timely suffer enormously, hyperinflation, crisis of unemployment. Those who addressed the crisis earlier did better. We're now at a juncture which has differences but also similarities. Again, you are not alone in this. So, what's a debt restructuring then? Basically, what a country needs when it does a debt restructuring is to reduce the amount of debt that it owes, to reduce debt payments. There are different ways of doing this. this if the problem is not too deep, maybe just with extension of maturities, maturity is the date when the country pays, maybe it's enough. But if the crisis is deeper, that's not enough. You need also a reduction of the interest rates or a reduction of the total value of the debt or a combination of all those options. And also, the country needs to negotiate with many different creditors the private creditors from Wall Street, China, uh, the Paris Club. Not only the country needs a crisis needs a certain amount of relief, but also that amount of relief has to be somehow distributed among the different creditors. Who contributes what? So there are two levels of conflict. The conflict between the debtor, which means you, the taxpayers, or who open the are to pay for the debt, and the creditors on the one hand. And the second level of conflict is a conflict among creditors. Typically, no creditor wants to go first in providing relief. It wants the others to go first, right? and then to try to get a better deal. Both levels of conflict are key for the way these processes are resolved. When it comes to negotiations with the private creditors, there is no international mechanism for restructuring these debts. These are contracts generally issued under the law of New York or the law of England. When the country issues debt in local currency and local law, the state acts as the, the arbitrator of the conflict between the taxpayers and the creditors within the country. But when a country issues it under foreign law, it loses that capacity to regulate over the conflict. And the only way in which a country can achieve relief is through a deal in which the private creditors voluntarily accept to change the language of the contract. They say, okay, I, you owe me less. I accept to get paid less. And that's a negotiation based on what? On power. Power is at the core because there is no system of principles. Every country in the world, virtually every country, has a bankruptcy code. A bankruptcy court for its, uh, and a code for its corporations. If a corporation uh, goes bankrupt, it can file for bankruptcy and there is a predictable process for resolving that bankruptcy. But we don't have anything like that. It's the law of the jungle, the most powerful win. And the government of the country in a crisis is the one in charge of defending the interests of the taxpayers in a very adverse international, adverse international context. But that's it. The role of the government in a country in crisis is key. It has to use its weapons and tools to create enough support and the international conditions for forcing 
the acceptance of a deal that makes the new debt sustainable. These are very complex processes. And Charles mentioned one uh, uh, concept that is essential in these processes. It's called the debt sustainability analysis. It looks like an innocent technical document. It's neither innocent nor purely technical. Uh, it's very political because it's about how to deal with conflict. Conflict is dealing with conflict is always a political process. Why conflict? Because there are not enough resources to meet all the promises. So we need to restructure those promises. And that naturally creates conflict. This debt sustainability analysis tells you how much relief you need, basically. Um, every country should be able to produce its own debt sustainability analysis. Because if you are going to negotiate with the international community, you need to have your views. This is what I need and then challenge the view of others. There is an international institution that is virtually the unique, it's basically the unique, the, the only one that produces this debt sustainability analysis and doesn't get very happy when countries produce their own. That's the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Okay? But uh, it makes a significant difference if a country has the capacity and also the will, if authorities have the will, to produce its own debt sustainability analysis and also discuss with the IMF on that basis and try to influence the IMF debt sustainability analysis. Private creditors also try to influence the debt sustainability analysis of the IMF. And China, which is today a big creditor, produces its own debt sustainability analysis, although it doesn't publish them yet. Okay? So this is important. And then when the negotiation starts, there are all sorts of asymmetry. To give you an idea of how things work, the stakes at play can be very high. It depends on the size of the country. I led the second largest sovereign debt restructuring in history, Argentina in 2020. The largest was the Greek debt restructuring in the 2010s. Uh, so we have to restructure $110 billion. That's a lot of money. So the, and the restructuring uh, um, had as the outcome a decrease of debt payments of $34.8 billion in a decade. That's a lot of money, $34.8 billion. So how much money do you think in it, it's required to have significant influence in the press, both in the domestic press and the international press. You just need a very tiny fraction of that. And the stakes at play are so high that lobbying is there at the very center. Lobbying is immense. Typically what creators will try to convey is that a default is the end of the world. It's the apocalypse and that if you don't restructure the debt in the terms that they try to dictate, it's also going to be the end of the country, and there's going to be litigation, and there will be a... And I'll tell you something, don't listen to them. Just a little bit, so you listen to yourself, but not to them, because they are, they are not going to defend the interests of the taxpayers of the country for these bonds in foreign currency and the foreign law. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that anything can be done because the country wants to keep a healthy relationship with the international community as a whole. Isolation is not, never good for, the, for, for an economy. Uh, uh, financing from international uh, development banks, uh, the, the access of a private sector to international financing, those are important things for the uh, uh, production possibilities of the economy, but in every single episode of the debt restructuring, the threats from creditors are overstated. They are most of the times almost empty threats, uh, and they, however, make leave a deep mark because of the way the international and domestic narrative uh, is influenced, mainly in the, in the press. 
So there are all these sorts of asymmetries. Then you could even find, and it, this depends on every, on every country. In my country, this, is, this was a reality, a campaign, a, a financing for campaigns, for political campaigns. So part of the political system could be in the hands of those that are negotiated with the representative of the taxpayers, which is a problem. Even the media could be funded by, I mean, they're not just the journalists, right, but uh, at the top level. So all these asymmetries of power, of information, um, the lack of transparency, they are part of these processes. And it's important for the government to always keep in mind what objectives need to be achieved. And the number one objective is the restoration of that sustainability. Secondary objectives are to try to minimize litigation, if possible, but conditional on restoring that sustainability and that, that, that way giving the necessary conditions to the country to restore economic growth. That's not sufficient. And that restructuring is only a necessary condition, not a sufficient one. But without it, a country cannot really recover. So let me now move to the third part, the IMF, if I have um, IMF, another complex institution. This is like a, if you really want to create an institution that, if you think how to create that kind of institution, I want to do that way, I don't think you, you would manage. It's uh, really uh, incredible the, the way it works. Uh, it's like for, it looks more like a science fiction movie, and I, I know this is super real. I actually, as I hear told you, I, I had to negotiate uh, a refinancing loan. Argentina in 2018 uh, borrowed the largest amount ever from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, it was a political law, so by then uh, the U.S. Uh, government, uh, Donald Trump's administration, wanted to support uh, Argentina's government and, and basically approved the largest loan ever, and Europe was silent about it. It was a terrible thing for the country, a terrible thing. And then when I was the finance minister, I had to uh, really, the country didn't have uh, $45 million to repay the IMF, so I negotiated uh, a, law, a, a refinancing deal, uh, so basically we changed the terms of the agreement uh, to, to avoid that uh, the country would go into the stabilizing uh, spiral. The Can you hear me well in English, right? It's quite interesting. Yeah. I go on, yeah, I just don't want the, you to, to, to be unable to listen. Um, so, the, as I was telling you, at the IMF, what's the IMF? It's a multilateral institution whose shareholders are the countries, the sovereign nations of the world. Okay, so it has about 190 members today. It was created in 1945, year of the end of World War II. We saw what happened in the global economy when we had so much instability. It led to political instability, it led to a world war, and we don't want to live in a world like, like that one, so we needed to fix and we it was healthy for the global economy to create a multilateral system, an international rule of law, with institutions that presumably would contribute to a more prosperous and stable environment that it would also be conducive to peace, global peace. The IMF was one of these institutions created in Bretton Woods, northeast of the US, very close to where I did my PhD in economics. I studied at Brown University. Uh, you know, it's a small town where leaders of the world met and agreed on the creation of this of, of the multilateral system that has been evolving since then, but whose main tenets are still in place today. The role of the IMF was supposed to be uh, to contribute to the stability of the global economy, the, fin the global financial economy. So what's the situation when a country has all of a sudden a significant shortage of foreign exchange? Doing the adjustment immediately may be too costly if you are 
the value of your imports is limited to the value of your exports because there is no credit and the value for, of your exports plummets, you need, in the absence of international assistance, a significant contraction in imports. And how do you get the contraction in imports? Through a contraction of economy. So we understood, not we, we were not alive. I was born in 1982, certainly no alive by then. But we as the humanity understood that it made sense to create an international institution on the principle of solidarity. A country that didn't need an adjustment, or the countries that didn't need an adjustment and had the capacity to provide assistance, would assist the one that needed the adjustment. The adjustment to ease, the, the, uh, the support to ease the, the speed of the adjustment. That was the idea. That's what was what a British economist, famous uh, uh, historic figure, John Maynard Keynes, would have wanted, what he pushed for when the MF was created. Well, it was supposed to be an institution based on the principle of, founded on the principle of solidarity. It's an institution that works on the basis of politics, on the basis of power. It has shareholders that are represented by directors at the executive board, and the interests are represented there are mostly the interests of the largest shareholders, and within the largest shareholders, the interests of their financial systems. So the interests of the American financial system have been overrepresented at the IMF. So when the IMF lends, it doesn't necessarily lend to ease the adjustment. Uh, you need to look first and foremost how that money is going to be used if a country is borrowing from the IMF. Is it allowing the country basically to uh, have a a more gradual path of consolidation of the economy, or is it being used to pay other creditors or to finance a capital flight? Those are key questions. If a country has a surplus of foreign exchange, the technical name for this is current account surplus. If the economists tell you this country has a current account surplus, clearly the IMF money is not being used for easing uh, the, the, the pain of the adjustment or for easing the adjustment as a whole. It's used for another thing. And this is money that comes with conditionalities. It is difficult to repay. To repay the IMF, you either need to create significant surpluses of foreign exchange or you need to recover access to the international credit markets and borrow again in the international credit markets to pay the IMF. But, but, it is unlikely that in the situation in which a country wants to borrow from the IMF or in a situation in which many countries at the same time, like now, are having crisis, there will be access to the international credit markets for those countries. It is not unlikely, it's virtually impossible. Capital flows in the global economy behave in the following way. When there is a global shock like now, a war, money flows to the advanced economies. Money, capital flows are what we call counter cyclical. They go against the wind for the advanced economies, but pro cyclical for the economies of the South. That means that when they are mostly needed, you get less of them. So these are not the times in which countries from the South will regain access to international credit markets. So they will not be able to pay the IMF if they borrow from the IMF. They will have to keep a relationship with the IMF for a long time. This is also happening to my country, and it creates significant troubles of all sorts, not only economic. So again, it's so important to understand, number one, what the IMF money is used for, and number two, that money has, comes with conditionalities. And those conditionalities may not be the ones that the citizens of the country want. 
because they are largely influenced by the largest shareholders or the interests they represent, not by the labor minister of your or the energy minister of the partner country for you or for your own country. No, it's going to be influenced by the interests defended by the finance minister of the advanced economies and. They, they, typically, they, as I said before, the the financial interest interest they're in. In any negotiation, the government has to be holding the wheel, and it needs to have a program. The IMF is highly secretive; it doesn't want much public discussion of the negotiations. That's not the right way of doing this for a country. So actually, in my country, I did involve Congress in a different political situation uh, in order to have a complete, transparent uh, a, a negotiation. If, if a government doesn't have a clear view or doesn't present to the society and to the international community. A plan, what tends to have is that the IMF staff has an easier time in the negotiation. So you need to define what you want when you are doing a negotiation, what the objectives are in terms of the economic policies. And a country that had a failure of the economic system needs a set of policies to transform its economy to create more productivity. Typically that requires, it will of course depend on every country, but typically that requires more investment in human capital, more investment in the public infrastructure that will create more productivity for the private sector, and lowering expenses that are less important for productivity. At the same time, certain degree of fiscal responsibility in the sense that whatever fiscal plan the government has, has to be financeable. It has to be financed in a way that doesn't create further problems down the road. So the fiscal part, the monetary part, the productive policies, all have to be included in the program. And it's not just about, so the issue of austerity is an important one. Austerity may kill, but that, a, a, leaving that aside, still, to have a thoughtful debate, it's important to be clear about the existence of constraints for financing, financing constraints. It's not that a government can spend tons of money. Who is going to provide the finance for that, right? So the program has to be well thought, understanding that there are limitations and that those limitations, those constraints entail trade-offs and making decisions about priorities. So let me conclude now uh, by emphasizing one important principle. All these processes of sovereign debt crisis resolution are political processes. They affect the day-to-day -day life of the people. And it's so important for the success in these endeavors to, to map, map policies into outcomes in terms of what they need for the people. The involvement of the society is very important. The, the involvement of the civil society organizations the involvement of the universities, the experts, the unions, the private sector. There will be conflicts among different parts. It's not the same the situation of a small and medium enterprise producing in, a, in the domestic economy and saving in the domestic economy and hiring workers in the domestic economy than a multinational company that can move from one country to another in just a blink. It's not the same. So there will be different interests. But as a whole, in order for this process of sovereign debt crisis resolution to be effective, the society needs to somehow converge to a point of understanding, also knowledge, and representation, political representation, that allows the group as a whole, the society as a whole, 
to be effective in the international fights that are part of these processes. So I wish you all the best uh, in your own challenges. Thank you.